Good morning. We're so glad you've joined us for worship here at First Baptist Columbia. If you're new to First, we'd love the opportunity to welcome you and answer your questions. Look for the digital connect card on our website or stop by the connection desk in the sanctuary foyer to fill one out. We have a special gift for first time guests, so make sure you stop by. We want to help you take your next steps here at First. If you would like to talk with someone about following Jesus, getting baptized, or becoming a member of First, simply fill out that digital connect card or stop by the parlor off the main foyer following the service to speak to a staff member. First Kids invites you to support international missions by making a donation to the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. 100% of your gifts go directly to the Southern Baptist missionaries serving around the world. Donate on the First Kids webpage and you will receive a nativity ornament handmade by our First Baptist Kids. Supplies are limited. Plan to join your church family next Sunday, December 19th at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary for one of our most loved worship services of the year, carols, candlelight, and communion. Prepare your heart and mind for Christmas. Make a note of a schedule change for Sunday, December 26th. We will not have Sunday school that morning, so join us for worship at the regular time of 10.30 a.m. Child care will be available for kids three and under. If you have family in town, bring them with you. Start the new year out in prayer with your church family at a night of prayer. Join us Sunday, January 9th in Ellis Hall at 5 p.m. for a church-wide prayer event. Dinner is served at 5 p.m., followed by a time of worship led by the college worship team and prayer time led by children, students, and adults to intercede for our church and its ministries as we head into a new year. Following the night of prayer, First Women's Ministry, Real Men's Discipleship, First College, First Young Professionals, and First Students will begin at four-week study on the Lord's Prayer. More details and registration will be on the website this week. The Strong to the Bone Osteoporosis class is designed to increase strength, balance, and flexibility for participants by incorporating chair exercises with elastic bands. Classes are held on Monday and Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. in the East Step Family Life Center. The cost is $40 for an eight-week session. Go to eastupfamilylifecenter.com. Don't miss all that's happening at first. Sign up for the weekly e-news at fbccola.com. And now, let's worship together. dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. With a tail as big as a kite. Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy.
Good morning. Let's stand as we all sing together.
Thank you so much. You may be seated. I feel like we ought to fall down on our faces. Mm. Well, the pulpit flowers today are given in memory of Annie Mae Culp and in honor of Clay Culp in recognition of what would have been their 76th wedding anniversary today. And they are given by their family, Ray, Janet, Lauren, and Andrew Grigsby. Then you'll notice for our television audience, we've been offering the little booklet, The Christmas Code by Dr. O.S. Hawkins. O.S. has a wonderful uh, booklet that he's written here. It's blessed us in these past days as we've read it. So if you will call us or write us, we will send you your free copy of The Christmas Code. Then uh, there are some, the Christmas pageant concludes today at 3 o'clock. We have some tickets that have become available. So if you're watching us, you may go online or you may call the church, and we would love for you to come and join us at 3 o'clock. And for those that are here, you can do the same thing. We'll have some tickets offered after the service is over this morning. Well, if you visit with us, we're sure glad you're here. I would ask you to fill out the Connect card. You may do this online and register your attendance with us today. But we're so glad you're here, and we trust the Lord will bless all of us as we worship together. This is Lottie Moon time of year, and Lottie Moon is when we give our offering for our foreign missionaries, and we're going to give you one more prompter about that right now.
Lord, we come before you celebrating the birth of your son, Jesus. As we go through this Christmas season, may we give you honor and declare your salvation, but may we not restrict it just to Christmas. May it be all year round. So now as we give our tithes and offerings, we're asking for your blessings, for your multiplication, so that everyone might experience the good news of Jesus Christ. For it's in your precious and glorious name we pray. Amen.
most holy, Lord most holy. We worship and adore you, O holy child of heaven. O God incarnate, one with the Holy Spirit, and with the Father. We lift our songs of praise to thee. So glad y'all heard that, and I'll just tell you that uh, that surely is a highlight at the Christmas pageant. I watched the two presentations yesterday, and I will be back again today at three. And uh, if you have not seen it, uh, and you think, "Well, I forgot to get my ticket," Steve told you there's tickets out there, so you need to be here and bring somebody with you, somebody that needs encouragement, somebody that needs to be reminded that Christ is born, and He will reign eternally. And uh, we praise the Lord for that. The grand narrative of the Christmas story is found in a few different New Testament books. Probably Luke's gospel is the most memorable. I think that probably many of you have memorized Luke chapter 2. And Luke uh, tells us uh, about the visitation, angelic visitation with Mary. And then in chapter 2, he tells us about that imperial census that sends the world moving. And Mary and Joseph travel to the ancient town of Bethlehem. It's there that the Christ child is born, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then we have those lowly visitors who come from nearby fields where they're watching over flocks. And they come to worship the newborn king. And all of a sudden in the sky, there's this gathering of angelic hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And uh, just a magnificent um, uh, picture for us of what happened on that day. Well, Matthew focuses on a few different details. Uh, Matthew tells us about the angelic visitation with Joseph to to point out to him, uh, to him also. He also needed to hear that God was at work, uh, not just Mary. And then he really hones in on the story of these visitors who come from the east. 
The Magi, who look into the sky and they see a star that announces the birth of a king, and they come to worship uh, this one who's born as king. And along the way, they meet the bloodthirsty tyrant Herod. And then Herod discovers what's going on. And of course, he goes and slaughters the children in uh, Bethlehem, the young boys living in Bethlehem. In the book of Galatians, Paul talks about at the fullness of time. When all of a sudden it reaches that point when God steps in and brings us, gives us the gift of his son. John poetically tells us about how the word became flesh. But this morning, I want us to look at John's other account. In the book of Revelation, John tells the story of the birth of Christ. But he gives it to us from the perspective of angels from those who can see beyond the veil uh, that prevents us from seeing more than just flesh and blood. It is truly a cosmic story, maybe a bit off a little bit more than I could chew for the message this morning, so I hope you'll lean in and the Lord will bless as we uh, study his word. Eugene Peterson writes of this text, this is not the nativity story we grew up with, but it is the nativity story all the same. Now, there's no shepherds in this story. There's no wise men, but there are angels. But they are not gathered in Bethlehem sky singing praises to God. They're engaged in warfare. They are warriors who are at battle. Revelation is a mysterious book. Many people are fascinated by it, uh, but they kind of, uh, they don't know what to do when it comes to actually studying it and applying it. There's a lot of question marks there because the imagery and... um, The symbols that we read there are often too cryptic to process uh, for us to be able to apply. So I'm just going to give you one pointer, um, which is the primary message of Revelation that might help you. If you decide you want to dive in and you want to start reading it, let me give you one pointer. This is the overarching message of Revelation, and it's this, Jesus wins. That's the story of Revelation. And uh, his victory is a certain victory. And in the Revelation, John sees signs and symbols, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's able to put pen to paper uh, of what he sees. And although it's very descriptive, it's still mysterious. Um, It leaves us with some questions about interpretation and uh, application. But the bottom line is this, Revelation is God's truth. It's our authority, so we come to study it as truth, and we come to consider it as the authority over our lives. The book begins with um, seven messages for seven churches. And then John tells us about seven seals that are set on a book, and then seven trumpets. And that brings us to chapter 12, which is where we are going to be this morning in our message. In chapter 12, John gives us two great signs that are the leading characters in the drama of this text, but also in the drama of human history. This morning we're in the third week of our series called Joy to the World, and uh, our sermon title comes from the third line of the first uh, verse of that carol, Let Earth Receive Her King. What you're going to find in our text this morning is that John draws back the curtains so that we can see what's happening beyond the veil, uh, what is happening and what will happen in the spiritual realm. And that's a helpful thing, because the nostalgia And the traditions of Christmas can really trip us up. And we will only focus on those things that seem lovely or those things that we're kind of drawn to. And we will miss the real nature of what's happening when Christ comes to be born into our world. See, his birth is a declaration of war against Satan and his entire kingdom. And we see in the text this great cosmic battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and he's born as the king of kings. So look with me, Revelation 12. I'm going to read to you just the first six verses. We'll look at the whole chapter, though, together. Revelation 12, verses 1 through 6. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. 
And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the true account of your word. And God, we just confess to you uh, that in some ways the mystery that's been packed into this book, into this text, has the potential to really trip us up. And so God, we just ask that you, that your spirit would come now and teach us and speak to our hearts. Father, we don't want to become more intelligent. We don't want to become smarter. We want to become changed. As you form us, as you form within us, the character of Christ. And so, Lord, would you use this moment here this morning to do that? Father, we pray for those who are far from you, that even now you would begin to draw drawing them, that they might see the cross and that they might respond. Now, Lord, just hide me and you have your way. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. The mystery of Christmas, no matter which way you look at it, is linked to danger. There's danger in the text. It's this ancient conflict between good and evil. And in the Revelation, John fleshes out for us that ancient conflict played out on a spiritual realm. Now, the message for us today, I would say, is this. That Jesus is the true king who has come to defeat sin and Satan. Now, we're going to consider chapter 12 in two parts. We'll look at the verses I just read to you under the uh, header, A Certain Savior. And then we will look at verses 7 to the end um, under the header, a a sure salvation. So a certain Savior, then a sure salvation. John writes here in in the Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, that uh, a great sign appeared in heaven. Now this is the first sign of chapter 12. There's two of them. And the first sign is this pregnant woman who is in heaven. But we recognize this to be the sky, the heavens And the reason we know that is because what's there with this woman, it says that the sun is there, and she's clothed by the sun, and she's got a crown on her head, it's got 12 stars on it, and underneath her feet is the moon. So these are heavenly bodies that we're familiar with in the sky, and they're there in this picture, this drama that's playing out before John's eyes that he's put to paper for us. Now let's pause here for a second, and let's just admit, this is strange, this is strange stuff. You know, what in the world is he talking about? Clothed with the sun. You know, it's just, it kind of can create some issues for us. And I'm afraid you might decide to tune out and you'll say, it's getting weird today. I think I'll just kind of read alone by myself here. But let me just ask a question that I think might illustrate what we're dealing with. Have you ever thought of someone who maybe understands your language, but doesn't understand the figures of speech or the idioms that you use when you communicate to others, what they might think when you hear, when they hear you say certain things? They know the words, but it doesn't make sense to them, you know? They might overhear you say, you know, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. And they're like, you know, do y'all eat horse? I didn't know that we ate horse, you know? They just, they can't quite process that. Uh, You know, or when you shout at somebody, break a leg, and they think, that is terrible, you know? They're getting up to perform and you're you're just wishing ill will upon them? What, What is this? They don't get it because they just take it literally what's being said. The same thing could happen As we read Revelation, what do you mean she's clothed with the sun? Is it like real bright clothing? You know, is it hot stuff? You know, is it big? You know, what does it mean that she's clothed with the sun? And this moon under her feet, is that like a rug or maybe like footwear? I mean, what, what, or what are we talking about? What does John mean here in these verses? Now, let me just go and confess to you. I am not going to be able to fully answer that question for you, except to say this. John is not speaking in literal terms here. He tells us he's speaking of signs, okay? That's what he says there. He's describing what he's seeing. And it seems that he is connecting this woman, this pregnant woman, this woman that's a sign, with the nation of Israel. Does anybody remember the great dreamer in the book of Genesis? Remember his name is Joseph? Joseph interpreted the dreams uh, for uh, uh, you know, for Pharaoh, but he also had his own dreams, didn't he? You remember, uh, he had one dream in Genesis chapter uh, 37, verse 9. This is one of those dreams he had. It says, 
Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. So a very similar visual found in the book of Genesis here. And in Joseph's dream, we know that the sun was representative of his father, Jacob. We know him as Israel. And the moon is Rachel, his mother. And these 11 stars are his brothers. They represent the 12 tribes of Israel when you put Joseph with them. So that's what they see happening in Genesis. One would assume that the sign that we find in Revelation chapter 12 is connected to this ancient symbol of Israel. Now, this pregnant woman here is the protagonist of this great drama that John is relaying. So who is she? What's well, Christmas? And we all know that the child that he's referencing is Jesus. So the, the woman must be Mary, right? The idea that the radiant woman of Revelation 12 is a very popular, particularly among Roman Catholics. Because, and it makes sense. Because we know Jesus is the child, and we know that the earthly mother is Mary. But as you continue to read through the chapter, you realize the details about this woman don't really tie in with Mary. We have to stretch it if we're going to make that happen, especially when you get into the last parts of chapter 12. In particular, verse 17 talks about how this old serpent turned his rage after that on the other offspring of the woman. Well, it would be very hard to put Mary inside of that box. So we kind of have to rule it out. Now, Mary is, of course, the earthly mother of Jesus. But the very beginning of verse 1 says what? A great sign appeared in heaven. Not a literal woman, a sign, something symbolic. So because of that, some people connect this woman with the church, the bride of Christ. Uh, but the church is born out of Jesus' resurrection and ascension. He doesn't come from the church. The church doesn't begin until after him, right? So the most plausible interpretation is that the first sign, the pregnant radiant woman here in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, represents the righteous remnant of Israel. This is God's redeemed people who have trusted his promises, by faith have followed him, and he sees them as a radiant and glorious people. And the woman is pregnant with the child because she's about to bear for us a son. And we know this son to be Jesus. Well, Jesus came from among that righteous remnant in Israel. In fact, Matthew and Luke tell us about the lineage of Jesus' earthly parents, of Joseph and of Mary. And then in verse 3, we get our second sign. Let's look there. It says here, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Who is the dragon? You don't have to read very far. In fact, you can just look down in verse 9 if you want to. And it says down there, The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. Um, so Satan is called a dragon 13 times at least in uh, the book of Revelation. He's a pretty ugly dude. You know, seven, um, seven uh, heads, ten horns, and then seven crowns on those heads. He's red. That connotes death. Makes sense because Satan is connected with death. In um, John chapter 8, verse 44, we read, um, The devil was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. This ugly red dragon is a murderer and a liar. And he has been so from the very beginning. Now, John describes his power in verse 4. He is not all-powerful like God, but he is a mighty foe. It says his tail... Uh, swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now, this illustration of stars in heaven is clearly a reference to those angels who followed Satan in his rebellion against God. That's who I believe that it is. Isaiah 14 tells us how Satan made all these claims, and he was basically claiming for himself the throne that Jesus sets upon. And Isaiah says, You have been cut down to earth, you who have weakened the nations. And then in 2 Peter 2, we read how God judges the angels who sinned. He judged them. So, presumably, that would be at Satan's rebellion. So, right now, uh, this is what you remember. Satan is not a close second to God. But he is a mighty foe with great power. And he is a deceiver. 
And so what happens is he leads these angels astray, and they are knocked out of heaven for it. Now the end of verse 4 says, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth he might devour her child. That is a picture of pure evil, pure hatred. And it is descriptive of how Satan, the devil, has related to the coming Messiah since God first announced that the Messiah was coming way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Think about it. We know that Satan is a lion prowling around seeking one to devour. Don't you think he would have loved to have interrupted God's plans to bring about a Messiah, a Messiah by way of the Israelites? Of course he would. And we see all kinds of attempts to do that. In fact, the first seed of Eve, Cain, becomes a murderer, kills his brother Abel. Now, I think he willfully did that, but you think that Satan, the one who's seeking to devour, is not behind that? And then we have Pharaoh. He's described as a dragon. And he has all these Hebrew boys killed. Remember, Moses barely escaped the infanticide that took place in Egypt. Think the devil was behind that? And then there's Saul. Remember, he's trying to kill David. He throws spears at him. He's trying to hunt him down, have him killed. Now, that would have really foiled God's plans to bring a rescuer through the line of David. And then there's this wicked queen who's described. Her name is Athaliah, the only female ruler of Judah. She was the mother of uh, Ahaziah, who was king, and he died. And when he did, she took the throne. She usurped it and uh, before Joash, his son, was crowned king. And then she went about killing the entire royal family, but they saved Joash in the temple. That's where he was hidden, and he uh, was preserved there. Don't you think that the great red dragon was behind all of that? And then we get to Haman. You remember Haman? Tries to kill all the Jews, except for Esther. You know, we're so glad that she was there. And then there's Herod, who tries to kill the infant Jesus. But what happens? The dragon fails. Look at verse 5. And she gave birth to a son. And it's here that we find the hero of our story. We start with a pregnant woman, and then we have a red dragon, and now we have a child born from among the redeemed people of God. The birth of the Christ child is truly a declaration of war against the ancient serpent called Satan and his demons. It is the first act of the downfall of our ancient foe. Because this child who is born will, the scripture says, uh, rule all the nations with a rod of iron. God is keeping his promise. John tells us about this coming king in his message to the church at Thyatira. Um, he says in uh, Revelation 2, verse 26, there at the end, to Jesus, I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, well, that also comes out of that great messianic psalm, Psalm 2, where it talks about the Messiah will come and he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. So God's been speaking of this all along, and here it's happening. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 5, and I hope your version has it just like this because it should. But there's a semicolon in the middle of verse 5. It says, And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, semicolon. Now, that semicolon in this verse is a placeholder for a 33-year period of history. Jesus is born, and then what happens? His full life and ministry. Culminating on Calvary with his death there, his resurrection in the garden. And so that's what the semicolon kind of is the placeholder for. At the cross, the great dragon would have celebrated exactly what he wanted to do to crush out this enemy of his. Instead, he didn't realize it was opening the door for the seed to crush the head of the serpent. That's what happened at the cross. So John leaves out the crucifixion and resurrection. He skips straight to the ascension. You see the end of verse 5? And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, it may seem strange that the revelation skips over the cross and the resurrection. It's described in another place in the book. Um, but in this cosmic story, what we have here is the ascension. Because remember, as Jesus ascends, what does he do? He's seated at the right hand of God. In other words, he sits on the throne that that great red dragon had been wanting all these times. Jesus wins. So what happens next? 
Verse 6 tells us about the woman. We know this to be the righteous remnant of God. So these are the faithful people of God. Uh, They're cared for by God for a period of about three and a half years. That's what that adds up to be, about three and a half years. Now, that's likely a period of great tribulation. Uh, We know there'll be a great tribulation that will precede the second coming of Christ. It also may not be an exact period of time. Some people interpret that three and a half years to be a... um, Uh, representative of the entire church age. So from Christ's ascension all the way up until now and continuing till Christ comes. Uh, Either way, this is the point. The church is going to face persecution. It's destined to happen. But what happens? God provides for his people. That's what he's saying here. So he has a place. He has a plan. He has provision. God will take care of his people. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 6 demonstrates that the story of Christmas did not begin in a city called Bethlehem. It began in a garden called Eden. I want you to think back to what you know about that garden. We have Adam, we have Eve there, and there's the serpent. We looked at this verse in a recent sermon. In fact, I just referenced it a moment ago in this sermon. After the fall of man, then God judges the man, he judges the woman, he judges the serpent, and it's here that he speaks the gospel for the first time in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We call it the proto-evangelium. It is the first gospel. Some people think of it as the thesis of the Bible. So if you read from beginning to end, you get to verse 15, you find the thesis. And it says this, God speaking to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. After sin enters the world of Eden, God begins to unfold his plan to break the enemy. And at Christmas, we remember God keeps his promises. Satan is a mighty foe. He's a vicious enemy. He's not above any tactic to bring harm to God's people and to defame God and his glory. But God is greater still. And Christmas is a reminder that God has won the victory. So Jesus, our certain Savior, who God sent to triumph over sin and Satan, and now we're going to look at our sure salvation. Verse 7, if you've read through this text, maybe you already did it while I was preaching. Verse 7 becomes a little bit more cosmic here, okay? So we see something in even a greater, stranger level maybe. We find out there is war taking place in heaven. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think about this war in verses 7 and 8. I think the war that's taking place is that war that leads up to Christ's death and resurrection. Now, other people take it a different way. That's that's what I think is happening. I think he's reflecting back here. And we're told here of an angel uh, on the scene called uh, Michael. He's one of two angels that are named in scriptures. The other is Gabriel. So, you know, Gabriel. Michael is the archangel. Um, He's mentioned in other places in the Bible. The book of Daniel talks about the strong Michael who comes against the the, the prince there um, in Persia, uh, the demons in in Persia. In Jude, it references Michael. And uh, so look at me, verses 7, look with me at verses 7 through 9. It says, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And at this point, I believe we have the crucifixion and the resurrection. Now look at verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Verse 10 describes Satan as an accuser. In fact, that's what the name means. The name Satan means deceiver. He's also called the devil, and the devil means slanderer, the one who lies. And then he's called that he uh, is a deceiver, which means his his responsibility that he believes or his desire is to lead folks astray. And I want to tell you this, Satan still accuses God's people. He still has access to heaven where he goes in to accuse people before God. But he cannot undo the work of redemption that was purchased for us at Calvary. See, Satan is a defeated enemy, and he knows it, so he is raging. He will not go away quietly. Satan knows he's a defeated foe. He recognizes he's on on borrowed time, so he is working feverishly to bring damage to the name of Christ and to 
damage the glory of God. And so you think of all the things you know of how he's done that, of places, maybe he's done it in your life. Maybe he's done it in others, and it's just brought shame to the name of Jesus. That's what he's doing. Verses 13 through 16 reveal Satan raging against God's chosen people. I believe that alludes probably to both the Jewish uh, people of God as well as the church, God's people. And you can track through history and you see this happen. And think of those, those events like the Holocaust, of him raging against God's chosen people. And then the church. You think of ancient Rome, where the Christians were, under Nero's rule. Trajan, all those that just did awful things to Christians. Well, that's not gone away. Neither is anti-Semitism. Voices of the martyrs and other agencies say that there are more Christian martyrs today than in years past. So the great red dragon of Revelation is still raging. Look at verse 17, the last verse of the chapter. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's you. That's me. What's Satan doing? He tells us. Coming after us. Coming for us. Satan is the great enemy of the church. He fights against God. Rages against God's people. He accuses the saints in heaven and he attacks his people on earth. So how are we to overcome the enemy? Look at verse 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Take note of those three things. First, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation 5, John says he saw a book that had seven seals. And then he begins to weep because he realizes there's nobody in heaven worthy to open that book to break those seals. And an elder turns to him and says, Stop weeping. Behold, The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And then John turns his attention to the throne, and standing there next to it is not a lion, but a lamb. The lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. He is the one who is worthy. See, our only hope of eternity with God and for salvation is the blood of the lamb. That's it. And I believe whenever we look at Jesus in eternity, we will always see him as that slain lamb, reminding us the only reason we're there is because of what he did and because he's there. And his blood cannot be erased. His blood is the power for salvation for those who will believe. And that great red dragon stands no chance against that blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. First, they overcame him with the blood of the lamb. Second, because of the word of their testimony. Now, we may read this and think only of our story of how we came to know Christ. But I believe it's something greater than that, something more than that. I think it is primarily the sharing of the story of how Jesus saves The testimony that Jesus does save. Paul asks this question, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they they believe in him in whom they have not heard? We must be reminded that as the devil rages, our only hope is the blood of the lamb and our responsibility is the word of our testimony. We must go and tell. Why? Because we are at war. And it's not just a war with liberals or with conservatives. It is not just a war with China or with Russia or with radical Islam. We are at war with that ancient foe, the serpent, the enemy called Satan, the devil. That's who we are against. And we are at war with him. And the only thing that's going to advance is by the blood of the lamb and then what? The word of our testimony. How will kingdom advance? Going and telling. And then notice the third point in verse 11. They did not love their life even when faced with death. See, there is something worse than dying. We need to remind ourselves of that. We live in a world where we are afraid. We are afraid of sickness and death in a very serious way. Well, for the believer in Jesus, there is something worse than dying. And it's loving yourself 
more than you love God, more than you love others. That is worse than dying. This time of year, we give the opportunity to sacrificially give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. That offering is named for Lottie Moon because she loved God more than she loved her life. You need to read her story. It's an amazing story. She labored for the glory of God and for the joy of the people of China in Jesus. She died on Christmas Eve, 1912. She was headed back here because her health had gotten so bad, but she died in the harbor of Kobe, Japan. And they say that as she died, in her final hour, she sang with the nurse who was there with her, Jesus loves me. And then she made one last sign, a gesture with her hands, which was a, uh, you know, that form of the Chinese greeting, as if she was receiving a guest nobody else could see. And I believe she saw him. So we give in her memory and for the glory of the nations. Christmas is the story of a certain Savior and a sure salvation. Isaac Watts wrote that song, Joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. Jesus has come. He has ascended. And let me tell you this, he will return. And earth will receive him as king. The question is, what about you? Have you received Jesus as king of your life? Heavenly Father, here in this moment, we just come before you and we're just honest. We need you. We need your blood. We need your salvation. And we need the hope of a king on our throne. So God, would you speak to hearts and change lives today? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come to a time of invitation. Right now is the moment where you just pray to God and you respond to him and his word today. As you've worshiped with us and heard the message this morning, I'm sure that God is speaking to many hearts and lives. Let me encourage you to go to your phone right now and call the number on your screen. We have folks who would love to pray with you and talk with you. So call the number on your screen. And we would love to pray with you right now. Once again, we thank you for being with us today. And I would say to you here, um, there's nothing more serious. There's nothing more important than your relationship with Jesus. You may be nodding at God by being here today, but let me tell you, there is coming a day of reckoning, and the only thing that's going to get you through is the blood of Jesus. Have you believed in Jesus for salvation? So I want to tell you, at the conclusion of this, you can just stop by. Make, 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 take advantage of this moment. On your way out by the connection desk or by the parlor, you stop and you talk to them. And uh, they'll love to share with you from God's word how you can trust Jesus today. Maybe it's about making a decision for Christ. Maybe following believer's baptism. Maybe joining the church. However, God's moving in your life. You take advantage of that moment today. Well, um, Christmas pageant went fantastic yesterday, Steve. I was so excited to be able to be here and be a part of that. And uh, one more performance at three. And you say you've got tickets. Is that right? All right. We can go out there to Washington Street area, Washington Street lobby, and there'll be some back there, and they can go online if they'd like to get them. Yeah, so y'all, y'all do that today. I'm telling you, it's, it's just worth being here, and I appreciate all of your work and commitment and labor towards it. You just do a fantastic job. <laughs> yes. Let me tell you about something real quick. I wasn't going to do this, but, we, we, um, uh, but I want to mention this. This past... Um, uh, week, we installed in the western corridor of the Boyce Chapel the uh, historic display. There's a couple pictures up there on the screen. It looks fantastic if you haven't been over there, okay? And I want to tell you, there's a few people that have just been working very hard towards this in, uh, in official capacity. Uh, our history committee, the chairman is H.E. Barkley. You can either raise your hand or wave or stand up, whatever you want to do. He's right over yonder. And um, that, well, don't clap because there's a few more people, okay? And i got to get through this. So we got him, Kayla Stevens, Lavona Page is on that uh, committee, and uh, also our curator, Rod Funderburg. And, uh, but I will say this. I think they would all admit there are two people that have worked very, very, very hard on this thing for months and months and months. First is Lavona Page. She has been writing and editing and researching and calling, and she has done, I mean, she has just done a lot of work. And then the second is Craig Houston, who's the designer, and he's right up here, and he's done a lot of the, the, uh, the artistic, the drawings and the design and put it out, and it has been a labor, I'll say, of love. I don't know if they'll say that yet, but uh, it is just incredible, and it tells the church's history. Um, 
as best they can in snippets from 1809 um, all the way up till this past year, uh, or this year maybe. I guess it goes through this year. So um, anyways, I want you to go by there and check that out and uh, just read the comments there. I'm just so excited about that. I will tell you this, it takes some time. So you might have to walk past it 30 times before you get it read. But uh, uh, anyways, I appreciate. Now we can give them their big applause. I appreciate all their hard work. Let me, uh, one more thing, tomorrow's our deacons meeting, and so before our deacons meeting at, uh, at uh, what time do they meet? 5.30, uh, you can meet in Ellis Hall, and our deacon prayer team, they gather there, and they will pray for church needs, they will pray for you if you're there, or you can just send a note with a prayer request, just drop it off at the connection desk, they'll be sure and get it to them, so they can pray for those things tomorrow. Anything else? I'm going to call an audible. Call the audible. Okay, let's all stand. And here's how we're going to close. I love it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Thanks for worshiping with us via live stream today. We invite you to join us again next Sunday via live stream or in person. Have a great week.